Hi, I'm Andrew Hilton. I'm the director of the Center for the Study of Financial Innovation. Uh, today, we're looking at a problem which is a little bit different from some of the, the issues that we've been looking at. It's the cladding issue. The issue that has uh, developed as a result of the Grenfell Tower disaster a few years ago, uh, and which threatens the entire UK housing market. Um, there are up to 11 million people in uh, apartments that have are considered to be unsafe. I have some skin in the game on this in that I live in one of these apartments. Uh, for me, this is an inconvenience. It's a big inconvenience, but it's an inconvenience. Uh, for many people in this building and in other buildings, it's much more than just an inconvenience. But let me just give you the bare outlines. I've been asked not to say the name of the building in which I live, but it is a 200 apartment block, which is considered sort of high end. Uh, the cost of remediation, is put at now 10 million pounds. But only half of that is actually cladding. The other half is all sorts of associated fire defects that were discovered when they looked at the cladding issue, and that's not untypical. The other problem that we face is that our insurance has gone up. It's gone up 600%, and for this particular building, it will be 870,000 pounds a year. Now, there are various proposals for how to handle this problem. Uh, there are various, um, various issues involved. There is the culpability of the builders. In, the, in our case, the builder naturally uh, went into voluntary liquidation <laughs> having produced this building, so we can't chase them. There's the liability of the insurance industry, like many of these. We are just on the cusp of uh, a 10-year 10 10 insurance guarantee, so you know who knows. Uh, and the liability is the liability with the leaseholders, the freeholders, or the government. Uh, there are various proposals out there. I'm sure you saw that the uh, Houses of Parliament, uh, the House of Commons passed a non-binding uh, Labour motion and 263 to zero to, con to urge uh, action to be taken on this. But the social impact, for me, this is, as I say, is an inconvenience, but a lot of people in this building can't move absolutely can't move and can't afford the money that they're very likely to, to be required to spend. It is put at about 40 or 50,000 pounds an apartment, of which, as I say, a maximum will be covered uh, under the, uh, the fund that the government has set up for the removal of cladding, the replacement of cladding. The rest won't be covered, but the government's fund at the present time is grossly inadequate. Maybe it's one and a half billion, uh, at least total, the total cost of remediation is probably somewhere north of $10 billion. So this, $10 billion. Pounds. So this is a really major issue. It is one that has galvanized the press. Uh, Martina Lees at the Times and the Sunday Times has been leading on this. Uh, the Spectator has had a, uh, a campaign. The Daily Mail under Ruth Sunderland has a campaign going. Uh, there are obviously political votes to be gained. Uh, Keir Starmer has said all sorts of things about how a Labour government will sort this out and nobody will have to pay. The money will come off the magic money tree. Uh, the Tory, Tory government has said, and in the case of Robert Jenrick, we'll do something, but, you know, maybe, maybe we, uh, you'll have to contribute. And there is a, a, a piece of work currently being done by Michael Wade, an insurance specialist who made his money at Lloyd's, uh, which should, I guess, be uh, released in the next week or so. Something may be in the budget, but there are also many other initiatives out there. So I'm delighted that we have got Martina Lees, as I say, separate senior property writer at the Times and Sunday Times who cut her teeth, I think this is appropriate, cut her teeth as a crime reporter in Johannesburg. Criminality is really what this is all about. So Robert Neal, Bob Neal, the Conservative MP for Bromley and Chislehurst since 2006, and a former member of the London Assembly, chair of the Justice Select Committee in the House of Commons, who has taken on a role as chairman of a sort of new APPG on the cladding issue, and Dean Buckner, the policy director, the voluntary policy director at the UK, Share, UK Shareholders Association, also a trustee of the, uh, uh, the Leasehold Knowledge Partnership, who has been, and a former, a former insurance data specialist at the PRA and the Bank of England, who has been working on his own 
I think interesting, uh, interesting, and in my opinion, very fair uh, approach to resolving this particular this particular crisis. But first of all, I'll ask each of them to talk for, if possible, no more than 10 minutes, uh, and then we'll get a discussion going. Um, but could you, first of all, Martina, lay out the problem as you see it, because you have a very broad view on this. Martina Lees. Thank you, Andrew. The fire that engulfed Greenfield Tower and killed 72 people three and a half years ago is still spreading and it is now hitting the whole housing market. It started out when we realized that there are about 30,000 other flats with the same type of cladding as on Grenfell Tower. Then we discovered that there are about 175,000 high-rise flats with other types of flammable materials, insulation and or cladding on their walls. And now we know that about 1.3 million flats of all heights, of all types of materials, are potentially unmortgageable for years. It is starting to really knock on across the property market. In September alone, flat sales halved compared to 2019 September. Um, and just in that one month, which is usually the height of the autumn market, we lost 1.6 billion pound of transactions in flats. Now, flats is the first rung of the property ladder. And if that rung is broken, it will break the second rung, the third rung, and so on. I've just sold my own house. We had to take a price cut uh, because we, one of the people who were really interested um, was in a flat who they that they couldn't sell. And we lost a buyer because of COVID as well. So with these two things together, COVID and the building safety crisis, I just see trouble ahead. So some say that it could now affect 11 million people, um, which is a very big number. So we are going on the government's numbers alone uh, of 1.3 million flats that could be unmortgageable. That means 5% of all private homes in England. So lenders now want proof that almost any modern flat is safe. Grenfell showed us that we can't trust building regulations anymore. So they want what is called an EWS1 safety certificate for pretty much any flat. So without that proof, lenders just won't lend. And um, the trouble is that getting the certificate is hard. There's only about 300 engineers who can issue them, but once you have it, it will probably find errors. In nine in 10 cases so far, they have discovered that the buildings didn't comply with the current regulations. Then they must be fixed. And that can take five to 10 years, taking into account the amount of resource available in the industry. And who's got to pay? The leaseholder and the leasehold law. They are the only innocent people in this scandal but yet they have to pay the bills. So the bills are really big. Um, typically, according to the government, 30,000 pounds per flat, but they have reached 115,000 pounds per flats in uh, some buildings I have spoken to. Um, there are new figures out from ARMA, the block manager body, showing that the average bill per flat is about 50,000 pounds. So that per building, it's about 2.2 million pounds just for the cladding um, to fix that. So why have we gotten to this point? What Greenville has exposed is decades of weakened regulation, failed inspections and substandard construction. This is about a lot more than the ACM cladding that was on Greenfell Tower. It is about a lot more than just cladding per se, whatever type of cladding you're talking about. It is really a scandal of building safety. Um, it's about the way we've been building for decades and the way that things have been signed off. And we still don't know how far this goes. We still don't know how many buildings are dangerous. We don't know which ones are, where they are, and how much it's going to cost to fix it. What we do know is that the bill is going to get bigger. Uh, than we, even the current estimates would say. 
But for me, what has really stood out in covering this over the last few years is the human cost, which is so immense. The people who put their life savings into these flats can't move jobs. They can't get married. They can't afford to get to have children. They can't retire. Um, the stories are just heart-wrenching. I spoke to one family, an NHS doctor and a nurse. They each have bought, when they're in their single days, uh, a, a one-bedroom shared ownership flat. Now they have two toddlers. They can't sell either flat. They have been locked down, literally sitting in the dark, because dad's working in the living room, mom's stuck in the bedroom with the toddler when the baby's sleeping. So uh, that is the kind of human cost to this. And we have to solve it. We cannot keep on just letting this go on. So the Sunday Times has launched a campaign to end what we call the hidden housing scandal. And as Andrew pointed out, there has been a lot of other media attention now and it's gained uh, interest in Parliament, uh, not least with the Labour debate on Monday. So the pressure is growing. But in my opinion, I don't think the government has really tackled this issue properly. Um, they have been very loath to take it on from the start. Every measure that's been announced over the last three and a half years has taken a lot of campaigning from leaseholders to get there. And it's been piecemeal. No one has that and really thought through this holistically and think about how are we going to A, quantify the problem and B, make sure the buildings get fixed and then C, who's going to pay for this. So the, what are the costs? Um, the one estimate that's out there is 15 billion pounds. That's from the uh, Housing Select Committee of MPs. The government has set aside about 1.6 billion pound in funding, which is about a tenth of what is needed. So, however, that funding doesn't cover any buildings under 18 metres. So it will only cover cladding and insulation above that height. That's about six storeys. However, we now know that half the average build per building, as in Andrew's case, is for stuff that simply breached building regulations at the time, very often. It is things like missing fire barriers inside walls uh, that would just... They should be there, but they're not there, or they weren't built correctly. It's nothing to do with materials that went on buildings because the rules were unclear and there's any kind of gray about it. This is black and white. It just didn't meet the requirements. So now who is going to pay the bills? The freeholder is responsible in law, the building owner, but they recoup the money from the leaseholder. The English law makes it impossible to claim from inspectors who signed off these buildings. It's very hard to go after the developers. Usually the construction companies set up a special purpose vehicle to build the building, which would have been uh, closed down. Um, and there's only a six year time limit on which you can legally claim as a leaseholder for, uh, under the Defective Premises Act. Um, warranty providers have paid out in some cases, but usually only where there's been a lot of pressure from politicians, from leaseholders, from the media. So, and manufacturers have not paid out a penny. Um, so in the Grenfell inquiry, there's been some shocking revelations last year showing how the industry has systematically rigged test results, lied about what is safe, sold products that they knew to be unsafe uh, for high-rise buildings for many years, which means they are on thousands of buildings and we still don't know which ones. So how do we solve this? The big answer on the table from the government is to set up a fund that's structured a bit like a bond from which buildings can borrow. But the question is who pays the interest on that? So, the government model, which is being developed by Michael Wade, as Andrew said, ultimately will get the money from leaseholders. They might lend it to the freeholder or the building structure, but ultimately the leaseholders will still have to pay. There's a big problem with that because it is basically like adding a second mortgage on top of a flat. And if you are talking about a flat up north, it really pushes people into negative equity. For example, um, 
there is a, one of the founders of the cladding groups is a young NHS doctor who's worked on a COVID ward last year. And he bought his flat a few years ago for 130,000 pounds. The remediation bill for his mm -hmm. flat is 100,000 pounds. Half of that is not covered by the government fund. It is for things that breach building regulations at the time. So he has to basically take out a loan for 50,000 pounds on top of his mortgage, which is about the same amount, and his student loan, which he's still paying off. It's an impossible situation. So there are arguments for making developers pay as the banks had to pay levies after the financial crisis. I don't see how the government can sell a solution where lease all this pay without making the industry pay. This is a scandal that has developed not just because the rules were wrong, but also because the rules that were there were being breached on a large scale by the manufacturers and by developers. How can they not help pay for what we are dealing with now? So what I really think that we need the best brains to come up with a solution that will work without making the leaseholders who can least afford it pay for this. These are people who bought a flat because they couldn't afford a home. Many of them bought shared ownership flats. They can only afford a share of their flat and yet they are fully responsible for the whole bill. It is grossly unfair to make someone like that pay for something that they did not build, they didn't make the rules, they didn't sign it off, and yet they are liable. Okay, well, let me ask Sir Bob. Bob, do you accept that general sort of tour d'horizon of the problem? Uh, and what should politicians push for? And what should we hope for? I think Marina gives, Martini gives a pretty good overview of, uh, of the situation. It is a very serious one. Uh, and it's clearly gone far beyond the numbers, I think, that the government initially thought uh, were going to be there. Uh, and that's part of the problem, uh, that uh, the more you, you dig into it, the more apparent it is that this reaches out far wider, both in terms of the number of buildings, uh, of the sort of problems that you are finding, uh, and also uh, its knock-on effects uh, down, the, down the, the housing market chain and the number of people that's affected by it. So the um, Communities and Local Government Select Committee has taken some fairly cautious numbers, which I'm happy to go with as to the numbers affected and the cost. It may well be more than that, uh, and Martina suggests. Uh, and what's certainly true is that the amount that was av available, both in initial and then the uh, enhanced funds, don't look to me as if they're going to be anything like enough uh, to cover uh, the, the cost that, that ultimately turns out to be. And that's going to go up rather than down, as I think more and more um, buildings and more and more issues are found. Um, coming back to the, the key point, um, I've got one tower block in my constituency uh, that, that's affected by it, but profoundly affected for all the reasons that uh, Martina sets out. And it's not a million miles away from your experience, Andrew, uh, at all. It's a smaller development, um, perhaps uh, not at the same scale of the market, uh, but exactly the same scenario. This, this was a case of uh, an office block that was converted probably in the 90s, I would think, um, to um, flats by what was then actually not an SBB in this case, um, but one of the major builders. But that firm has now um, amalgamated um, more than once, uh, been bought out effectively. The legal entity that built it no longer exists. Uh, and uh, the position that uh, my um, constituents face, exactly as, as Martina was saying, with just the cost of remediation, but also costs of waking watch, and the discovery also of, of other building defects, compartmentalization and other matters, um, which all add to the cost, probably lead them into the same sort of proportions that you're talking about between remediation costs that may be covered and they're in the process of applying for the grant. Uh, I took the, the case uh, particularly because the grant process was so bureaucratic uh, and slow and actually you had to stump up money in, in advance to get a surveyor's report to uh, fund uh, the uh, business case uh, to make the grant for the application. And as you say, these are people uh, who essentially whose flats are unwashable anyway, uh, and whose savings have been exhausted by the increase in service charge that they've had to pick up for the cost of the waking watch and the other matters. Um, because otherwise, uh, the London Fire Brigade was proposing to, to render, declare the flats uninhabitable. Uh, so 
you know, they're, they're in the perfect storm there, aren't they? Um, the problem is, uh, in, in the case of, of these folk and many others, uh, that not only has the developer uh, ceased to exist for all practical purposes, uh, secondly, in many cases, the freeholds which were retained uh, when uh, the flats were sold, the freeholds have then been sold on. And uh, what we have found, and the group that I'm uh, uh, leading and my responsibility for cladding, is within the uh, overview of the All Parliamentary Party Group on uh, Leasehold uh, Reform and Common Hold Reform, chaired by Speeder Bottomley, uh, part of the House. And what we have found is that in some cases, where you have had builders who are still in the game, who still got skin in the game, who still have a reputation to worry about, they're the ones who have been susceptible perhaps to pressure uh, and have been prepared uh, to remediate. And the government's original plan, if you remember, when James Broker and Child was still community history, was just sort of name and shame um, the developers uh, in the hope that that pressure will cause them to pick up the tap. Well, some did, but only the ones who had something to lose, frankly, uh, either because they wanted to continue, frankly, to sell their homes uh, or indeed to have access to the, um, the homes that were being, being built under the new homes um, bonus and uh, right to buy and so on. That doesn't work. Uh, for uh, those circumstances where the freehold has been so sold on and they're generally held by a, a property trust, a property investment company of one kind or another, they're nothing like so susceptible uh, to, to market pressure. Uh, in the case of, of uh, my own constituents, it's actually the family trust of a pretty well-known um, uh, oligarchical family um, uh, who uh, operate uh, a vehicle for their very extensive uh, property portfolios uh, and uh, Having met with their chief executive, it was quite clear that they were not remotely uh, going to uh, pick up the tab and were going to rely, as you referred to and Martina's referred to, upon the clause, which is commonly in most leases, uh, which uh, will enable uh, the uh, leaseholders, the freeholders, to pass on uh, the cost of remediation work uh, on to the flat owners, onto the leaseholders. Uh, and that is a problem uh, with, with, with the way it's structured. You can't, as a matter of law, um, uh, go back and override a private contract where it would be a very exceptional uh, thing to do. Um, uh, that would be a, a difficult step um, for Parliament to take. It is not, I think, constitutionally impossible, um, but the idea of retrospective legislation to override uh, private contracts is not going to be an easy one to sell. Um, but uh, what we are trying to do uh, within Parliament is to keep up some pressure in a number of ways. Uh, one is to press the government about the quantum of the fund and to say simply it's not it's not enough uh, the difficulty of course is, is that this comes at a perfect storm financially as well uh, with uh, covid um, the massive growth in public debt that's come inevitably because of funding of the lockdown and the job retention economy support measures that have been put in place there not an ideal time to be saying to government you have to to pick up on top um, a multi-billion pound tab as well However, I think we do have to, to grasp the nettle uh, that the moral hazard ultimately, I think, falls uh, on government if you cannot uh, demonstrate that there was negligence or some intervening act by the part of others against whom you can then realistically pursue for the money. Uh, and those are the, two bit, uh, those are the two bits that's concerned. There may be some instances uh, where it is possible to go against the freeholders, but I don't think they're going to be by anything like the majority. Um, there may be some instances where you can prove negligence, though there is the issue with the six year rule and the normal limitation acts in bringing a claim. But there may be certain circumstances in, in which you might prove negligence in the design or construction to the standard you could bring a claim. It's a long drawn out business and that doesn't really help the uh, people in an, um, in an unsaleable uh, and unremortgageable flat who've exhausted their savings in the interim, does it? So that doesn't really help in the long term either. The real problem, which I think Martina was referring to, is that over a period of, uh, of decades and uh, under governments of different political complexions, there has been a systemic regulatory failure. Now, it may well be that in all honesty, officials who were drawing up uh, uh, the regulation relied upon what they believed to be um, the uh, scientific evidence at the time, I think perhaps Further down the Grenfell Inquiry line, we may find out more about whether that's 
reliable or not. I remember when I was a minister uh, in the, that department, um, reliance was placed upon what the work that was done by the building research establishment, for example. Um, and that very often underpinned some of the work that was done on the on the fire regulations uh, and the building regs. However, pretty clear now uh, that for whatever reason, the system, the governmental system, if I can call it that, was not picking up the risks uh, in this type of cladding. And not just the risk of the individual component parts, it also strikes me that what was not uh, taken account of was the, the conjunction of certain types of component parts, certain types of materials being used together as well. I think there's some evidence to suggest that uh, created an additional uh, hazard. So ultimately, if it's a failure of regulation, who stands behind the regulation? Well, although administered um, generally nationally, originally through local authorities and then through a system of sometimes self-certification or other forms of outsourcing, nonetheless, uh, it's uh, a national system of regulation underpinned by Act of Parliament. And so I think the logic says that therefore government uh, owns corporately uh, the system of regulation. <coughs> and if there is therefore a, a systemic failure uh, of regulation, then ultimately it's government uh, that bears the corporate responsibility <laughs> for that. That's unpalatable for the Treasury. It's unpalatable for ministers. But that I think is the... the position that we ought to, to, to recognise uh, and uh, the position that we, we need to be working uh, towards. That's why I've supported what's called the uh, Mc, uh, McFarlane Smith Amendment to the Fire Safety Bill, which would prevent the freeholders passing on the historic costs onto the leaseholders. That deals with part one of the problem. The issue we need to perhaps talk about today a bit more is what do you then do with part two of the problem? Who then does pick up the tab if it's not the not the leaseholders? I agree with Martina. I think um, the loan system isn't going to be a satisfactory answer for all the reasons that uh, have been uh, rehearsed. And at the end of the day, uh, to put a loan, a second charge in effect, uh, upon people who have bought in good faith, have done nothing in any way to demonstrate any kind of negligence, who have acted entirely properly in reliance upon uh, their professional advisors, surveyors, uh, lawyers in every respect, cannot be right uh, that their property is effectively permanently devalued by something which they had no control over, could not probably have been trawled against in any event, uh, and could not realistically be expecting to do anything about, never mind the societal consequences of that. That then leads us to the question, perhaps, of the industry uh, levy. That is, I think, worth looking at. Uh, and uh, that may be the best route. Uh, I am troubled that the government, although I'm a member of the government's party, I'm not really having to be critical of, of them on this one. Uh, I'm troubled that there has been that shift in rhetoric, uh, which has been picked up from picking up the costs and leaseholders will not be out of pocket. Those are the assurances <coughs> James Brokenshire and uh, originally from Robert Jenrick, now to um, uh, leaseholders should not pick up unaffordable costs. It's a subtle but very important and I think very worrying change <clears throat> because that suggests that government is moving away from what I think is the, the both morally and legally correct position that they should underwrite the consequences of government's own corporate failure uh, to something suggesting that we want to lay off some of that. And well, if it's to be laid off, it certainly <clears throat> shouldn't be laid off on the innocent leaseholder. It may be an argument that collectively if there's been a failure by government, it's also been a failure by the industry, by the development industry, and perhaps they should be bearing the cost, sharing the cost to some extent. So I think we ought perhaps to examine that with some seriousness. That's preferable to the to the uh, loan system. There are danger that this is going to become a partisan political issue and a level. I, I hope not. There is a risk. I mean, we, we live in a, a yeah, we live in a highly charged environment at the moment um, politically. Um, uh, and that's why I was disappointed, though I understand why, why it happened. The, the, the Labour Opposition Day motion, um, not sure entirely helped, because that was couched inevitably, and the debate was couched in quite partisan uh, terms. And you can understand if you're an opposition, you want to take a pop at the government on something you think they're vulnerable on. Um, uh, but it didn't help, given that there's about 20 plus Conservative MPs and, and more growing who are signing the uh, uh, McFarland Smith Amendment. Um, and I think that's a, a better route, simply because that has a legally binding effect. Uh, and an opposition day motion wouldn't of itself. It would be a, a, work, a start statement of opinion. It was good to debate the issue, but it, it wasn't going to bind the government's hand in any way. 
So I think the timing. I mean, you, you, I think you've yeah. painted a very, very plausible picture of the problem. And also you pointed in the direction of a couple of potential solutions. But timing is an issue here. Uh, is. You, you may be looking at four or five years. Um, it, massive social and economic immobility yeah. as a result of that. I think that's right. And that's why the government's got a choice. Of this. It's either got to increase the fund straight away or at the very least maybe do a linkage between some sort of industry levy as a long-term solution uh, and perhaps a loan system underwritten in some way by government so to, 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 to cover um, in the, the interest and perhaps guaranteeing the loan uh, to keep the rate down as a bridging uh, device um, for the leaseholders to get the works done. That would be different from a situation of it falling back as a second charge uh, and therefore per permanently taking a chunk out of the value. So maybe that sort of combination of the two uh, would be a way forward so that you would have the government back loan to get the works done and give them security, but then look <coughs> for the repayment uh, of that loan from the industry levy. That, that would be a uh, solution I think might be worth exploring. And at the moment, what are you anticipating from Michael Wade's work? And uh, there was talk that an announcement we either made in the budget or by Robert Jenrick perhaps before the budget. Yes, that, that's <laughs> certainly, I think, still, still very likely. Um, uh, I had one conversation with Michael Wade where he wasn't giving a great deal away, but that seemed to be going uh, in, in that suggestion. Um, by the nature of his background, that seemed to be postulating towards a, an insurance space type of arrangement. Um, uh, but uh, I, I wouldn't regard that as being a, a satisfactory <coughs> long-term solution for the reasons I've already set out. So I think there's going to be a bit more of a battle to come on our hands yet. I don't think um, we are yet going to get the ideal solution. It may be a, a starting point to then take forward. But I'm, right. I'm not hopeful that we'll get okay. where we want Could to I bring change. in Dean, Dean Buckner here. Um, you are somebody who has lived his entire professional career in the depths of the financial services sector. Um, my little think tank is the Center for the Study of Financial Innovation. Is there an innovation we can find that'll solve the problem that will square the circle? Okay, shall I, shall I kick yes. off? Yeah. Um, Okay, I'll just start a bit with, with the background. Um, there are, in any question like this, there, um, there is a question of who should pay. There is a question of who can afford to pay. And having decided those two, there's a question of how they, whoever you decided who it is, pays for it. Um, skimming over the first, because we've covered a lot of the ground here, who should pay? There's the issue of regulation, and that always divides into, was it a failure of compliance? You know, was the regulation okay, but were people cheating? I think there was evidence coming out of Grenfell that there was simply a failure of compliance there. There, there were sort of fake tests and all sorts of things, um, as I read it. Generally, the failure of regulation is just the failure to draft regulation correctly. Um, you know, you have what's called principles-based rules and uh, principles-based regulation and rules-based. Uh, regulators don't like to put themselves at risk by going on principle and, you know, common sense. They prefer to have rules and boxes that they can tick. So I think on balance, um, there, there is evidence that it was a failure of, it was a failure of regulation. Rules not properly drafted. Um, of the arguments we've omitted, there are economic arguments for who should pay, and um, any solution should be such that it encourages people, gives people incentive to do things better. And to my mind, putting the bill on leaseholders is, is the economically the worst possible situation because you've, you've written a get out of jail free card to anyone in the future to say, well, it really doesn't matter what goes wrong. Whatever goes wrong, we're just going to bug it upon those who, you know, who can probably afford to pay and and. Can't, can't protest if, if they're made to pay. So who can afford to pay is, is different from who should pay, clearly. Um, and, you know, the art of politics, politics is that compromise, you know. Um, typic typically, who pays is who can afford to pay. So, you know, you have um, income tax works by, you know, you have a £12,000 limit of you don't pay any tax at all. Uh, the the highest earners will pay the most tax, both as a proportion as, and as an amount. Um, so there are strong arguments for not having leaseholders, some, some, of, some of whom you know, have just bought properties, cannot afford the extra cost of any loans and so forth. Um, 
but really coming into this, where I came into this uh, as a trustee of lease, leasehold knowledge was when I went to a presentation by Michael Wade, which was um, which was his proposal, which as we understand hasn't changed. And the idea was um, Michael spoke spoke very coherently and, and almost passionately on you know on the unfairness. He 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 said straight away, look, it is totally unfair that leaseholders should have to pay a penny. You know, he agreed with all the arguments that they were not involved, they didn't choose the design of the building or the cladding. Um, it, it is totally unfair. He his starting point was, yeah, it's unfair, but um, legally they have to pay. So his argument all along probably still is that there is no other way than of imposing of setting up a large fund uh, and then lending or f forcing a loan onto freeholders who would then pass it on to leaseholders so we, we call it the forced loan system and where, where I came into this my professional background is not in building legislation or fire safety it's um, basically the valuation of very long dated cash flows you know cash flows extending out 50 60 or, or more more into the future um, and valuing a product by saying well here's what it pays here's what the outgoings are what is what is the value of those two what's the present value as we say so I came into it from that point and my immediate reaction to Wade's proposal was that um, well there is another way, there clearly is another way. Set up a vehicle, a, a special purpose vehicle that looks like a bond to the outside world, uh, pays a coupon for 50 or more years at market rates, which you could sell to the private market. A lot of insurance companies, life insurance companies, who want to hedge their annuity payments, their outgoing payments with um, income from some kind of asset. This would be ideal for that market. So on the outside, it looks like a bond. The difference would be that on the inside, this bond has statutory powers, which would be given to it by Parliament, um, and which would allow it to oppose to impose a levy on those that those it is felt as a political solution of those who should pay and who can afford to pay. Uh, we have suggested, but we're not we're not tied down to this. We have suggested um, a levy on uh, developers, possibly also builders. Um, for 10 to 15 years um, on, um, and that would be raised by a, say a 1% form of stamp duty on property sales, but all up for grabs on freeholders uh, via a ground rent tax. Now if freeholders claim they don't have any money because they only collect small amounts of ground rent. Um, however, they collect that ground rent for as long as the lease lasts. That could be up to 999 years and typically up to 50 or 60 years. So if you imposed a tax of 10% on ground rent for 50 or more years, you can actually, the present value of that sum is quite a large amount. Um, we also proposed as leasehold knowledge, a, a foreign buyers, a non-domiciled foreign buyers tax, which has had mixed reception. Some people feel it's unfair because you know, these people, foreign buyers aren't to blame for any of this. On the other hand, you know, they can afford to pay. And some people say, and a few MPs have agreed, that actually these foreign speculators are the people you should tax. But this is not the essence of the scheme. The essence of the scheme is raise money via cash flows paid over very long dates, very long periods um, from whoever should and can afford to pay. So that's the idea. Um, on timing, Andrew, um, that's an interesting part because we, we met the minister, Stephen Greenhalgh, a couple of months ago, and uh, I made the point that under our proposal, you would not, uh, the, those, those upon whom the levy is imposed would not have to pay straight away. There would be a five-year starting point. So from five years onwards out to year 15, 20 or longer, there would be payments. That gives, that gives those affected by the levy a chance to get their business model in order. It wouldn't be like a windfall tax where you know, you say, oh, you must pay five billion or something to some large uh, developing develop, developer. Um, and then the share price instantly goes down and everyone goes mad, um, unacceptable totally. Uh, this would be a much, a much leaner form of imposing the same cost, but over a much longer period. So that's, that's, that's basically the difference. Um, Wade's proposal, we still don't know exactly what it is. Uh, we've heard rumours quite recently that there will be a 10 billion fund set up, which will impose loans upon freeholders and hence leaseholders. But as I and say, our proposal will be 30 year just, loans. Yes. Sorry, the the assumption is there are 30 year loans, and what will be the interest rate on them? 
the interest rates, nobody knows. Michael has mentioned one and a half percent. That's probably a bit high for that period. But um, yes, it would be a, around 30 years. Mm-hmm. As by contrast is uh, 50 years, probably about 0.8 to 1%. Mm-hmm. And who, in, in your proposal, I mean, Martina, you have looked at uh, Dean's proposal, right? What is your view on it? <laughs> I think that the LKP proposal that Dean has helped write is the cleverest one I've seen. So it really deserves a, a more attention and, um, you know, some refinement. But I, I I think that that's really worth exploring. I just don't see how the government can sell a leaseholder loan scheme as palatable without wrapping it up at, at with the people responsible for the scandal. This is not just a scandal of the rules were wrong. Um, this there is also the rules were breached. There are so many examples of buildings that just lack basic stuff like fire barriers. Okay, that is clear in do... building regulations. There's no argument about that. So sure. you, there is a very strong argument to say the polluter must pay. The industry knowingly breach the rules. They should I, I understand all of that. The, the mechanics of Dean's Dean's proposal. Could you just? I mean, because I'm not sure that that uh, that Bob is as uh, is as familiar with it as as Martina <laughs> is, and I'm not familiar with it. Just explain the mechanics of it. Who raises the bond? How is the bond serviced? <clears throat> is that what well, this is? This goes to a, a a special purpose vehicle set up by the Treasury. Um, yeah. Dean, if you could just just walk us through it. Well, there are many ways of doing this, but let's say a special purpose vehicle set up by the Treasury with an underlying guarantee to whoever buys that investment um, that the government will ensure that uh, the coupon is paid. So go out to the market, um, say a 50-year bond priced at 0.8% to 1%. Which is, at the present time, realistic. That is realistic because you, I, I'm just looking at the market rates. We're, we're in the u- unique position where long data deals have just collapsed compared to what they were ten, even 10 years ago. Um, that means that the present value, as we call it, of any future payments, um, uh, both on either side, is high. So that's the attractiveness of it. You can raise money very easily. So that's what it looks like from the outside. From the inside, you have a stream of pay- you have a stream of payments going out at 0.5% of 10 billion, say, whatever that amount is, uh, paid semi-annually or annually. You then calculate their present value of that, so you discount all those payments back to get a number. You then want to get a stream of income from the levy, which can be over any period you like. We're proposing it starts at five years and ends at around 20 years. Um, Then you make sure that the present value of that stream of income balances the present value of the stream of the outgoing. So then you have paid for everything. It's tax neutral. Assuming the government does not contribute, which you you know could on one proposal, um, so it's tax neutral. It would be accepted by the market. The only problem would be the political one of saying, well, clearly there will be a levy. The vehicle would have statutory powers. Um, what is a politically acceptable solution uh, on whom that on on the parties to whom the levy would apply? And, That's a political, not an economic question. And Bob, is there any sympathy for this kind of um, this kind of solution? Well, it's certainly one I, I, I'm, I'm very interested in personally, and it, because I think it's by far the most credible um, uh, solution in economic terms, and I think is being capable of being made uh, politically acceptable with a bit of courage from the government. Um, uh, because if the political objective is as it should be, that it shouldn't fall upon the leaseholders, um, and you know there'd be profound electoral consequences for any government, given the number of people who are involved, Precisely. And may I say that presumably leaseholders are a natural conservative constituency. Exactly. I I think that's right. Yeah, I'm I'm sure that's true. It's, it's, you know, you'd hope (laughs) self-preservation might kick into this um, with with, with the government. You would also help. You would also note Martina's point that this falls disproportionately on northern leaseholders, where property values are lower, but remediation costs are just. I think that's right. I think it'd be quite interesting, something for work for the APPG and other campaigns to do, is start talking to some of these people in the red wall seats, if we're going to start okay. getting some some traction uh, on this. And I think that's, that's really valuable. But it also, I think, squares the circle of not everything coming on the public purse, um, um, which is the chances issue. The, the bit that we need to get around um, it is 
follows political reasons to overcome the sort of treasury orthodoxy and sort of degree of um, reluctance to, to to go down the idea. Not a problem with underwriting the coupon hem. That's you know, it's pre precedent enough for that uh, um, for the bond. It's the, the linkage of the of the powers. But you know, I don't think with a bit of imagination and will that's incapable of uh, of, of being done. Are mind. there any precedents that either you or Dean can think of? <clears throat> I don't know about you, Dean. I can't. You, you probably will. Will have, any of the rescue packages, the bailouts that we've done with two thousand? On the idea of a vehicle with statutory powers, you have the license fee. You have. Um, yeah. We have the vehicle and road tax. We That's have. Um, yeah. Wow, well, there's yeah. one out there. The financial services compensation scheme. Uh, yeah, that, that actually is not financially designed. It's actually you know you just wait till some disaster occurs and then it's then you put it yeah. back on the industry. This this proposal would ensure that cash flows are balanced. Looking further back, you've got the financing of the Napoleonic Wars. That was a much larger deficit than anything run up here. Yeah, you really have before, yeah. Fighting the French for, was it, 20 years? Yep, that's true. So that temporary thing, income tax, wasn't it? That's the thing that, uh, that all came in to, to pick up the tab. Well, that was no, the I, I, consoles, yes, correct. Consoles, that's right, yeah. Um, but I think that's credible. Um, it, it's, it, 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 we've, the problem has always been uh, that I don't think the, the Treasury had, a, had much of an idea or government had much of an idea. They went to Michael Wade. Michael's looked for a market um, related... Michael's background, I should say, is reason. in Pool Re. So he he understood <laughs> this from yep. a Pool Re uh, insurance crisis. Indeed, approach. that's right. That was the other thing that was talked about, was a, a version of Flood Re. Um, that might be... that. That's yeah. the other thing that was kicked around. But it would meet the point of, uh, of having a, a market-related solution to this, which I think will be instinctively and philosophically where the government would like to go. And where I, and where I would like to be. I, I'm not of the left. You know, I've worked no. in the financial yeah. markets for, you know, over 30 years, if you count now. No, I, I, I agree with you. I'm not, yeah. I, I, I would, I'd, be, I'd be comfortable. I, I, you know, philosophically, ask, philosophically, what is the political feasibility of this, given that Michael Wade's uh, contribution is about to be launched upon the world, given that Robert Jenrick is about to say something, or if he doesn't, Rishi Sunak will in the March the 3rd budget. Are we too late with more radical ideas, or is there still room for it? I mean, at the same time, there is obviously enormous pressure to actually get some of this done work, this work done, because yeah, yeah. people are trapped, effectively. Well, I think that's where we need, where we need to look at um, taking maybe the first bit of, uh, of what Michael Wade is likely to come up with, uh, which is the the fund coming forward at an early stage. I don't think in the overall scheme of things that we're the amount, the amount of money we've had to print uh, and, and, and the amount of debt we've inevitably had to run up at the moment. The sort of quick bridge to move into uh, into Dean's scenario is massive in the overall scheme of things. There, it's a bit extra on PSBR and so on, but you know, heaven's sat traditional um, playbook is out of the window at the moment because of COVID anyway. Uh, so, 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 so I don't think that uh, necessarily offends. Um, I think what we've got to do now is to just make the point that Michael Wade's proposals, if they are as we anticipate they may be, um, <laughs> but whilst going in the right direction, still have the flaw, the political flaw, uh, of putting the cost onto um, uh, the leaseholder and electorally important, to be blunt, uh, element of, of, of society. And also, perhaps to be morally wrong as well to do that. Put those two together. I think you then, when Michael comes out with his, his idea, we then need a swift response to that. Say, so here's how you I, take that, but then um, reshape it uh, along the ways that we're suggesting. Martina, I would add to that. Not is it just unfair? It would also not achieve the objective of freeing up the market yes. if you suddenly add this big liability on a large lump, number of flats. <laughs> that no one's going to touch a flat exactly. with a barge ball with that sort of, um, you know, loan attached to it. So they still won't be sellable. And then we still all stuck and the market is still broken. So um, that is a very un-Tory solution. Yeah. Well, that's the other thing you go back to generic on is actually, Robert, you've got another objective, which is to, to more responsibly kickstart the housing market, get the housing market moving. Um, if a considerable chunk is gummed up, um, and that cascades up the chain as people move from flats, let's say, into larger properties or vice versa, if people downsize. And that comes up the whole of the works at a time when you're also trying to increase supply uh, uh, at the same time and having to fight a political fight on that. 
Yes, I, I mean, I would argue that the, the biggest, the biggest um, cost is really the social cost. The yeah. fact that people can't move physically, yeah, they can't move, they can't move location. That means they can't move jobs. That means yeah. that you have a generation, and it is effectively a generation, which is going to be in some sense trapped. But uh, whether we're too late to do anything about it, I don't know. I mean, Martina, um, political pressure, social pressure, pressure through the, uh, the newspapers, yourself and your colleagues. Do you see any happy outcome to this? I don't see a quick solution, but I see a lot more action from the government now than there has been in the past. So I'm hopeful, but um, yeah, I'm probably more of an optimist on this than um, some. So we'll have to see. I don't think it's too late. Um, I, I, I really also think that if we can get some real good brains on this problem to add ideas and refine it further, who knows? Well, we so, don't need too many brains. We need a brain <laughs> with a political, with political nous attached. Are you that brain with political nous attached, Dean? No, I'm not a politician. I've never never understood the uh, phenomenon. Um, so what are you doing with your idea? I mean, obviously, um, well, to... I have to see. I have a team of people at Lisa Norwich, some very competent people who you know do the PR stuff, are talking yeah. to newspapers. Um, we also have a really, really shit hot. Sorry, I can't say that. <laughs> we have a very good lawyer um, who, who understands these legal matters. So um, they are pursuing the political objective, if you like. I'm. I'm just trying to look at the financial solution and so explain that in a way. Sorry. The pressure is being put on parliamentarians through the APPGs, through yeah. how, how is it actually working? They, they are. We, we met um, Mike Ambry on Tuesday, just that was after the debate, and he was um, very sympathetic and very supportive. Um, but then, of course, as, 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 as we said before, it, get, it then gets turned into a political game. Um, as we saw with the debate on Monday, um, I can't pretend to understand the politics. Right, but you, Bob, you can understand the politics. You get the final word. How do we, how do we progress this? How do we uh, actually get a solution which is not unfair and which is as exped expeditious as we can, given all the pressures that everybody is under on this? What's, what's your advice? I think first of all, we take we 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 take the solution that Dean's been talking about. Think about how we how you politically deliver that, um, uh, and link that to the uh, Michael Wade <laughs> report coming out, uh, and you make that politic you ena you enable the government to own it, basically yeah. enable the government to come along and say, look, yeah, we we adopt this and make it our own. We want to tweak it as necessary to make it what, what, what they require to keep the essence of it. Um, that way. Um, uh, they have not suffered a political loss. That's why they couldn't simply roll over to um, to an emotion that Mike uh, was proposing on, on Monday, because that would be a political loss, of course, so they resorted to abstaining. But if the government can own it and then can recast it, if you like, for their use within their own political terms, this is a private sector, this is a, mar a private sector market-facing solution, suits us as conservatives, also happens to stick um, uh, a social justice point uh, and a levelling up north-south divide point, and then you can put together a package which uh, you can say to a physically uh, astute and also um, financially astute chancellor um, uh, that this is something which really ought to be sort of natural territory um, uh, for, for, for you to be looking at with both your professional business and, uh, and political backgrounds uh, all together. Uh, and it helps the government then to get out of a a serious bind in relation to its other really important social policy objective of uh, dealing with the housing crisis. Yep. So you try and create a sort of a virtuous circle. We we ought to be about sending this conversation, you know, so let's send that to all my 649 colleagues for a start, just to, to get people aware that there's an idea out there. This conversation will be wrapped up as a video. It will be put up on our website. Yeah, and Absolutely. On send them the link and that will be yeah. great. Uh, by this time tomorrow, which will Great. be Friday morning, well, by, by Friday morning at the latest, I do hope that you will pass it on to your friends. Indeed. Can I thank I can Dean? Can I thank Martina? And of course, can I thank Sir Bob McNeil? Uh, Bob McNeil, sorry, I do apologise about that. <laughs> Bob McNeil. Many times, I did. <laughs> the Irish brought to the family. And can I thank all of you for watching? Many thanks. Great.